First of all, I would like to thank you for your kind words. Apologies, my French does not go so far as to be able to explain our work in, uh, in words. I would like to say that it's very important uh, of, for greetings from Shelley. Unfortunately, she cannot be here today. But this room is very important to us. It was many years ago when we had just won the competition for the Bocconi University, when we stood here and we gave a presentation and we got a standing ovation and Shelley and I could not believe it because you wanted, I think Kareem wanted to order a bus and go immediately to Milan, even though the building wasn't built. But it was really <coughs> an important moment for us because it gave us courage and it also, I think, which is something very dear to our hearts, that the community of architects is very important. So thank you, the society. Very important for our lives. Okay, so this, you are here this morning to discuss the European dream, the European uh, city. So uh, this conference prompts reflections on ways contemporary and future cities welcome individual and collective life. And architecture can be seen as a profession that makes cities so that we can eventually welcome people. And our collective imagination can be harnessed to provide useful, safe, and enjoyable places that enrich the existence of humans and living creatures. When Shelley and I were appointed directors of the 2018 Venice Architecture Biennale, we drew up a manifesto and we called it Free Space, which described at the very heart of architecture a generosity of spirit, a sense of humanity, particularly focusing on the quality of space and not on architecture as object. <coughs> so each architecture, each construction and infrastructure project has the potential to discover and develop its own unique free space, an invention, an additional element which can become a free gift to the citizens of whatever city we might be dealing with. So this conference asks a number of questions on ideas of architecture and of the city. Is there a common denominator between European cities? How far does architecture and urban projects go to uphold cosmopolitanism without succumbing to the uniformity of globalization? What weight does geography have in representation of societies in an age of virtual exchange? Recently, I was asked to launch a book by a colleague, Professor Lachlan Keeley in Ireland, and the book is called Stones in Water, Essays on Inheritance, the Built Environment. It's a mixture of architecture and planning and poetry and anthropology, research and questions and methodologies. Uh, but the book describes the years of discussion and dis togetherness that we all have in trying to find collective ways of understanding history, change and culture, describing development of charters, and one of the footnotes is really important, as I am honoured to stand here in Paris today, because it says, and I'm quoting from the footnote, one of the outcomes of the Paris Peace Agreement of 1919 was the founding of the League of Nations in 1920. Under its auspices, the International Committee on Intellectual Cooperation was set up in 1922, followed in 1930 by the International Conference for the Study of Scientific Methods for the Examination and Preservation of Works of Art in 1930. This led to a meeting of experts in Athens the following year and resulted in the Athens Charter for the Restoration of Historic Monuments. ICOMOS, the International Charter for the Conservation and Restoration of Monuments and Sites, in 1964, was written following a meeting of experts convened by UNESCO, which was established after World War II under the umbrella of the United Nations. The idea of the World Heritage Site was given formal expression in 1972 with the establishment of the World Heritage Convention, and then inscription on the World Heritage List forms the basis of a site which is of outstanding universal value. And I read that this morning because it's like a litany. And I was struck by this footnote reminding us all that one thing does lead to another. 
and that when we work together, humanity benefits, and over time, we learn from our mistakes. So this morning, first of all, I should have thanked formally all the people who invited us to speak here this morning, so please accept my uh, gratitude to, to be here. And now I need to move to the next uh, slide, which is a slide of... I'll start by saying that architecture is a combination of ideas and facts, concepts and lived reality. So I begin with a bench that deals with human comfort because it signifies human care and human welcome. This is, uh, these are two images of Santiago de Compostela. And it's interesting walking here today because this is Rue Saint-Jacques. And this is also, so maybe we are on a route to Saint-Jacques, to Compostela, intellectually maybe. But the Compostela in Galicia in northwest Spain is known as a destination originally a Christian pilgrim route of the 9th century. And it's believed to be the burial place of the biblical apostle St. James. But what's interesting for us architecturally is that pilgrims to Santiago over the centuries and now they still walk there, now perhaps more for well-being and personal transformation than for religious reasons, whatever the driving force to set off across Europe to that city in the northwest corner of Spain, just close to the Atlantic, there to greet you on your arrival among the many powerful and impressive granite buildings and spaces is a singular and generous stone bench. So this morning, I'll refer to a number of our projects, but I want to focus on the gift to the citizen. Adding to the original need of a project, architects have the capacity to add another ingredient. So I'll show you five city projects, uh, one in Dublin, one in Toulouse as mentioned, Basel in Switzerland, Kingston upon Thames and, Lon and uh, London, uh, England. So this is an image of uh, our city in, in Dublin. And this project is about continuing layers of our own city. The electricity supply board needed a new headquarters and believed in the city and in continuing their presence within the heart of the city. We won this competition, uh, Grafton Architects, together with O'Mahony Pike Architects in 2011 on a site in Dublin 120 metres long by 60 metres deep along Fitzwilliam Street, which you're uh, looking at here. And for us, this project required deep research into the essence of what was familiar, or what is familiar to us in our own city. The character of the brick wall, the street, the repeated doors and windows, the front areas, the areas cut into the basement, metal railings, entrance doors repeated, chimneys, parapets, and landscape gardens. And we developed, we developed a strategy for 44,000 square meters of <coughs> office development, continuing the existing street, completing the urban block with a crust of brick and a matrix of offices, with embedded landscape courtyard gardens, reinforcing the urban, uh, uh, the original grain. On the, the lower drawing, if you can see it, there is a sketch about embedding landscape. And for us, it's about grain and discovering that the Georgians in the 18th century actually manufactured landscape. They, it was a natural landscape. There were formed uh, gardens uh, in sections for them. And we created, if you, I just want to check the pointer. The pointer. Yes, this works here. This is Merrion Square the, uh, in the heart of Dublin. And the site, uh, which is here, is 120 metres by 60 metres. And we were trying to find a contemporary language uh, in terms of how do we inset uh, the 44,000 within the city block, but also what we could give in terms of the citizen. So what we did was, originally, the blocks were solid blocks uh, for private houses in the 18th century. But what we have done is that we have brought a porous, there are a series of lanes, that's our Parliament House, a series of lanes that come through, and we have extended a new public route uh, through, the, uh, through, through the block. So here also we have 
uh, the, the route, I'll show you the route here in this. So this is the, the Fitzwilliam Street, the main Georgian Street. A new route, which is uh, approximately 60 metres to go through for the general public to move through. And in terms of the building, the porosity of the building, that we made a series mm -hmm. of courtyards which uh, carve into the, into the block, but also allow us to make this very narrow series of block in terms of the, uh, the um, uh, cross ventilation and sustainability. And in terms of landscape, each of the courtyard is filled with mature oaks Europe from European uh, nurseries, trees of birch, of rhododendron, and, and uh, uh, ferns. And we transformed the back street uh, into, from a laneway and a rat run, we call it for uh, you know, fast traffic, into a new south-facing uh, plaza. So here we have, it's just interesting, I suppose, this image the, we maintained the, the street is really a, a form of public, uh, it's of participation. So this, you're now in the lower level of one of the courtyards. What you're seeing is a, a colonnade, a four metre colonnade, which we used as part of a device to hold the line of the, uh, of the city. So when you're passing by, there's a rhythm of 7.5 metre um, uh, rhythm of the Georgian houses. There was a controversy about this site back in the 60s because six, <coughs> 16 Georgian houses were knocked down. Georgian houses were built in the, uh, the uh, late 1700s and they had a kind of a, a very simple rhythm of uh, about seven and a half meters. What we found about replacing those seven and a half meter rhythm is that it's really like a um, a Bach melody that, that actually doors and rhythms and windows are things that the general public actually respond to uh, e emotionally. And there was a huge controversy back in the 60s when these <coughs> buildings were locked down. There was a, 19, a 20s, uh, in the 20th century, a building was built, but instead of the 16 doorways, there was one doorways. It was a building that the general public really reacted to and did not like. Uh, so for us, we were trying to find that kind of line between history and modernity. So we carved the interior um, of this block for these uh, gardens. And the, the four meter deep colonnade not only holds the street edge, but also allows movement. And in terms of light, you've got uh, it, the, the uh, larger uh, windows on the lower level getting smaller and smaller in terms of reacting to solar uh, impact. But also in terms of garden, we have the pleasure and uh, light of the spaces below. And while we, uh, if you like, embedded landscape for the pleasure of the citizen, it was also for people who would work in uh, these offices. This, um, it's, it's essentially the headquarters is, uh, is offices. But it's interesting. There's, a, there's, there's two books which we came across. One is called The Nature Principle. Uh, by um, an American writer called Richard Loew, L-O-U-V. And he, uh, another book that he's written called The Last Child in the Woods, Saving Our Children from Nature Deficit Disorder, which is really very interesting because what we found was that he says that our society has developed such an outside, outsized faith in technology that we have yet to fully realise how human capacities are enhanced through the power of nature. And to quote him, he says, quite simply, when we deny our children nature, we deny them beauty, end of his quote. But for us as adults, what is really important is that we believe this to be true of adults as well. And this project in, in Dublin is not just about historic research. It is also about sustainability. In fact, sustainability is at its heart. Natural ventilation across the narrow block dimension for us is in really achieving, you know, it, it achieves cross ventilation. It also achieves bream excellent. But they're below this building where we make the street, the street on the right hand side. It's also about craft. This is an 800 millimeter wide 
uh, solid brick wall because we didn't want relieving angles where in contemporary construction that you have to relieve the brick every uh, floor to restrain it. We wanted that there was not just the street in a historic reference but that craft was also brought in and the electricity supply board were on board. They'd had such, if you like, public outcry for the many years before. Craftsmanship was something that they also supported. So this is, uh, uh, in, talks of, in terms of European, it's a German brick. Uh, it's uh, 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 the windows here, the metal windows are from the Netherlands. The it's just interesting that this building could be described as a, as a European building. Here is the, uh, the, um, uh, the colonnade, walking down the colonnade. And this is the public space uh, made to the south and the east transformed into, uh, into a new place and you see our colleague enjoying the benefits not of the, Sandia, uh, San, uh, the uh, Santiago de Compostela bench but that the, there's a quote from James Joyce I think that one of the hardest things in life is to find a, a free bench in the sunshine. So, um, so here also in terms of the landscape on the bottom uh, this image on the lower is really as a passerby that even though in some of the courtyards you may not be able to enter, that you have the pleasure of being able to see uh, landscape within. And here is a view of the, of the roofscape where you have this relationship uh, of landscape uh, to, to the sky. I've actually eaten uh, last year wild strawberries grown on the roof of the ESB, which is just really not very nice. Not only are there solar panels and uh, numerous beehives, but also the view over the city uh, is, is fantastic. And uh, we're very conscious that we're in your country, and it was a real pleasure for us to win this competition uh, at this junction of the, the, the Canal de Midi, the, the, the Garonne, the broken medieval wall, which, it, which is here, and we just, uh, we had just finished uh, Bocconi, and Bocconi is, is, if you like, in a, in a rationalist city, this amazing city in northern Italy, and this was Toulouse, which is much more organic and much more, uh, um, uh, if you like, related to nature. And when we were doing our research, these are the, the photographs of looking at these fantastic buttresses, these beautiful brick buildings that are so solid in themselves, the amazing bridges that cross over the Garonne, and these gorgeous uh, small courtyards with semi-external uh, circulation. And we felt, and it's one of the questions that you ask in your conference about globalization and place. So we were trying to find, like, uh, uh, are there clues within the, the skin of this city that can be translated into contemporary work? So we, in this, this uh, sketch uh, is really trying to describe this sense of a 21st century courtyard where there's the, the, the climate in Toulouse could be captured and um, educationally that you could have this space uh, where it becomes a courtyard, it has this sense of being inside outside, that you'd have the research offices uh, around and that the orange in that section are really a series of boulders in answer to your kind of questions in this um, uh, conference about, uh, about place. These boulders were of the, the big uh, conference rooms were really seen as big elements between which we could focus on the city of Toulouse. And this is a, we love this, this drawing because when it was pinned up on the wall in, in Toulouse, the builders described it as the butterfly. And we loved that because this is the lower ground. It's moving up to being um, uh, the, the entrance level. And as it moves up to the end, it does seem to uh, separate itself. These are just under 11 meter bars of the other bent to respond to the, um, uh, uh, to the depth for cross ventilation. So it seems to fly. We loved that uh, interpretation that, that a building as it moved up towards the sky would become this, uh, this other kind of creature. And carved out in the center is this, this void, which is the educational uh, overlap. <coughs> So it sits in with the, the beautiful canal as it turns with the, with the, with the stone. This is the, this is the breach in the medieval wall. So you've got the brick here and this position uh, as, as this building tries to sit in. And the cloisters, the, the cloisters 
that are dotted all over Toulouse. We use the sky cloister to frame the entrance as you, as you came from the city. And we love this, uh, this image of this student standing on the, the, the balcony, looking down at the, the canal as it comes in, looking out over the city. And it's something to, to, to question the, the point raised by this conference, conference about globalization, that, that really architecture has a role to make you feel more where you are, not that you're in the middle of Alaska or you're somewhere else or Dubai, that you are in Toulouse, looking out at a place, and that a building can reinforce your sense of identity, that you know you are a student in Toulouse, looking at a particular uh, part of the earth. And this is a, we love this image with the magnificent Garonne uh, pouring over the, over the weir. And this junction to us with the brick uh, just here, we didn't want to do plaquettes when we were making, you know, where we have tiles applied <coughs> to buildings, that there's an emotional relationship with the brick. And we found near Toulouse, not far from the city, was a factory where they still made the bricks in nearly identical ways uh, as the Romans did. So this breach in the wall, so it's, we had to change certain things, but finding the, you know, I mean, Shelley's passionate about, you know, the, the, the grain of the mortar. You know, architects are ridiculous, aren't we? We worry and lie awake, you know, about what is the grain and feel of the mortar. So the worry about all those uh, surfaces of what architects do. Just a little touch on a, 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 build, a competition that we have won in, in uh, Dreispitz in, in, in Basel. Sorry, before I leave Toulouse, actually, if I may, I, I should have just, just that um, the William Curtis um, um, article on reading a context, how institutions and their buildings shape Europe, uh, which was referred to. Um, there's, he, he's a very, it was written in the Architectural Review back in July 2010. But what he p says here, I think is interesting. He's talking about the, the project. The reading of the context went further than the geological base through the strata of time, up to the levels of light and air, and touched upon the spirit of the place. It has also involved a trans-European par parallel. And I may not have uh, understood the, the introduction so well. Maybe you refer to it already. But what was interesting is that he's quoting us. It's kind of ridiculous. But he's saying that, you know, that our understanding of our city, of Dublin, comes through. And that's the way, as architects, the one you know. Actually, Moneo has a beautiful reference about when you know one city, it means that you can relate uh, to another. But in Dreispitz, in, in Switzerland, this is a competition uh, uh, we won part of with uh, um, the uh, local architect, Christian Blazer. And what is really interesting is that what we found in Dreispitz and in Basel, that there are key aspects about uh, global warming. There's huge temperature uh, issues, and there's a big problem with the, the heat island effect. And this is a... It's, it's an area that was a storage for railway, uh, a storage area with huge railway infrastructure. And for us, what was really important for the competition is that we said that landscape came first and that we would remove the hard ground and we'd use uh, planting to mitigate against the, the heat effect and the island effect. And we, we worked with a fantastic environmental engineer, Klaus Boda. And these are the studies, the kind of... Uh, if you like, um, scientific research showing the huge uh, heat banks that, that actually build up in these areas uh, within cities. And that what is interesting is that it changes through, these are wind studies in terms of the sites, these are the sites that we're dealing with, but also that the pleasure of uh, shadow. There's no, I remember being in, in, in your city, in, in Milan, and the little courtyards, you realize that the physics of courtyards is that you get shadow and sun, and you get vec uh, natural uh, convection as a result. They're, not only are they historically important, they're scientifically important to have uh, a, a cool air and hot air. So we're reusing this, and the not only is it to do with landscape, but it's also fantastic when you retain building. This is really, I suppose, about uh, radical reuse. Taking existing fabric. On the right-hand side is an old uh, uh, car park. And what, what's part of the brief, which is fantastic, is that uh, in, in this, uh, on this left-hand side, we've converted and modified a building here, and that's for the Faculty of Law. And on the other side, where they look at, is 
is a school of, is a circus. So we thought it was a really good combination for lawyers who are a bit of acrobatics. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> would be right be, beside one another. But just in terms of uh, radical reuse and compositions of, uh, of um, uh, junctions. This is a, a project which we have uh, um, completed in, um, uh, in Kingston, in, uh, in just south of the city of London. And the reason for talking about it in terms of the gift to the city is that this is a university that uh, really was, it started off as, as technical schools and modified and has a series of 1970s buildings here. And this was a competition that we won where in front of the building had been uh, 250 car parking spaces. And so for us, the transformation of city in terms of city of welcome is that how uh, that, that the car takes so much precedent now that we would transfer between these existing, these are uh, um, evergreen oak trees here, and this is the site, that this is now transformed into, a, a, if you like, a, it's, it's for the students, it's for the city uh, of, of Kingston, but it also is across the road from what had been the, the town hall. So this is transformed. And the reason for talking about it with you today is that this is the, the, the transformation, but also that the element of colonnade and, and portico not only is historically um, uh, 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 an important element about expression, but it's also about layering. So what we, what we did here is that the upper image is really a person within that kind of uh, soft tissue between the building itself and the, uh, and the city that somebody can have a, a, a place to sit. So there you have a, a, a student or somebody waiting for a bus stop. So this colonnade, which is here, is the membrane between the, the city and the, um, and, the and, the, uh, and the university. This was a competition to two crazy, talk about the law faculty and the circus. This was about a library and dance. And urban dance is really a very noisy uh, and loud um, uh, element, sorry, uh, function. So this was really, how do you make a library and dance work together? The element here of the colonnade is not only about fire escape, it is also about balcony, it's also about viewing out. You can actually see Hampton, Cro uh, Hampton Court across the Thames uh, to the west. <coughs> so this plan, I won't go in, in detail to the plan. Sorry, excuse me. Sorry, excuse me, I'm walking around too much. <laughs> Pardon me, is that better? Okay, uh, excuse me. Um, this is a, a plan of the, uh, the colonnade, which is here. You enter into the building. This is the, what we call the, the courtyard, which is the auditorium, turned around from the original competition to face out to, to the city. But we really want to stress this, as I suppose also in terms of, um, as architects, that things that are fire escapes, like in, in Toulouse, the six ends of the, the brick piece in the Toulouse are fire escapes, but they're also references to the, to the, um, uh, to the enclosure of buildings within that city. So this is our, uh, the, the plan. This is the section. So you get the, the, the main space and the interconnection of, uh, of the other uses. And this little diagram, which is up in this place here, is really about spatial uh, interconnection between the quiet library and the noisy dance. If I go on to this one here, this is the space uh, which is uh, the gathering space, the auditorium, uh, and up here you have the behind here are the dancers uh, uh, practicing, and here you have the library. So this is about uh, interconnecting, overlapping, <laughs> and finding ways of spatially to hold together and to hold apart. Maybe that's a, a metaphor for, for city itself. So also, you, what is amazing in terms of education, we call this building a warehouse of ideas because one of the really interesting points about the, this um, uh, townhouse for the University of King Kingston, this generation, this is these uh, students are usually the first generation of people to go to university. And the, the client is incredible because they didn't want to have barriers at doors. They wanted taxi men and women to come into the building to feel free to move up through the building. So here are students, students of dance and students of many other faculties overlapping with one another. And in terms of welcome, this is the position of the main staircase which brings you right up through the, 
uh, library. So, uh, on the right hand side is the <coughs> court uh, um, auditorium moving up to, um, to be able to move out to the uh, colonnade. So in the colonnade you have landscape, you have places to, uh, uh, to, to walk and see the city and to participate. In fact, one time I went up to two students sitting on one of the benches outside and I asked them, you know, how are they feeling? They were from another university. They had come <laughs> there to study because it was so uh, uh, easy to find places to, um, uh, uh, to study. Okay, this is the, the, the last uh, project which I'll share with you this morning. And this is a, a, a project um, uh, for the London School of Economics uh, on an amazing location within the city uh, of London. This is the, 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 the Thames River uh, down here. And as you move up uh, from the slope, you come into the, into the campus of the London School of Economics, which is an amazing campus because it's really part of the, the weave of the back streets of, of this area. There's law uh, over here. And they seem to crop up quite a lot. So there's the law courts are here. And this was the site onto Lincoln's Inn's Fields. Lincoln's Inn Spiels was, is a historic uh, place within the city of London, and they had a 55-metre elevation onto this space. And for us, what was really uh, striking was right across the square of the Lincoln's Inn Spiels is the John Soane Museum. And the John Soane Museum is a really very important um, museum in, uh, in England and uh, uh, is free to access... It's interesting, poor old John Son had two sons who were wasters and were waiting for him to die so that they could sell all his masterpieces in his house. And in order to protect the museum, he made his house into a museum. So if he had good sons, we'd have no museum. Um, so maybe it's worth it having wastrel children uh, sometimes. Anyway, in the making of this building, it was the, the position onto the square, the linking, so we had essentially a number of elevations to deal with to, uh, to connect back uh, in, into the city. And sorry, just before I leave here, over uh, on this place here is a beautiful little chapel uh, called Lincoln's, uh, the Lincoln's Inn Fields Chapel. And what was really beautiful about that is that it has this beautiful structure which is public. And the main space of the chapel is raised above so that there's this kind of sense of openness and um, uh, generosity. And here is our building. This is the 55-meter uh, facade. These are other buildings that uh, exist on the south um, uh, element of the, of the city, of this square. So here we have our building, which is uh, ground. Its section is, uh, uh, if you like, rising up through educational up to offices. And here, just uh, this person sitting on the bench, which if you can see in this image here, you're looking down on the threshold as you rise into the main entrance with somebody sitting on the, on the bench there. And for us, in terms of structure, what was really important is that below we have uh, um, sports facilities, a big sports, uh, 35 by 20 by 8 meters high. And there's a slope. I don't know whether you can appreciate it at this one here. There's a slope as this building goes down towards the river Thames, which in architectural uh, terms you really have to deal with. And in terms of the uh, education, it's um, uh, lecture halls going up to offices. But the, the gift, going back to the theme of today, which is city, that this e element here, which is what we call the, the, uh, the Great Hall, is not in the brief, but by architecturally pushing all the elements up and all the elements down, this and by using a form of construction which transfers the loads because the loads coming down here and have to span over the 20 meters of the sports building down below. We uh, developed with our structural engineers, AK2, this system of transferring, uh, transferring loads. So just nearing the end of my presentation this morning, this is the, the sloping floor of the Great Hall as it connects to the city. This is the staircase through the structure that brings you up through the structure to the teaching levels uh, below. And outside that window, outside that window and inside that window is also uh, this continuous bench. So both for the students of um, London School of Economics and for the passerby, you have this kind of going back to Santiago to Compostela, going back to what cities are, going back to generosity. This is uh, 
we loved this one. I don't have the photograph today, but because the slope in the ground, there was a, a, a small person sitting here, and down here was a basketball player, at last finding a dimension that, that suited him. And just, uh, just to finish, this is a, 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 in the John Soane Museum, there's a beautiful uh, section where they did a photographic section up through the space. And in terms of our free space, we did a, an exhibition recently in the John Soane Museum, twinning <coughs> the two works over centuries. And this, this is a cloud point image of our building. And we just love this, this image. This is the f sloping floor, the staircase rising up, the two levels of teaching, and going up through the space to pass the offices up to the uh, research um, uh, institution. And I'll just, um, I'll just finish um, referring to towards a critical regionalism, six points on an architecture of resistance. Kenneth Frampton, he, in it, he recalls two of the philosopher Jean-Paul Ricoeur's questions. One is how to become modern and return to sources, and the other was how to revive an old dormant civilization and take part in universal civilization. Critical regionalism is an encouragement to adopt modern architecture critically for its universal progressive qualities but at the same time reminding us that the value should be placed on the geographical context of the building. And according to Frampton, and I quote, the specific culture of the region becomes inscribed in the form and realization of the work. This inscription, which arises out of the inlaying of a building into the site, the prehistory, sorry, has many levels of significance, for it has the capacity to embody in built form, the prehistory of the place, its archaeological past, and its subsequent cultivation and transformation across time." End of quote. So as I finish, we sometimes say that architecture is a silent language that speaks. The choreography of spaces need to be actually experienced to fully understand them. Reading plans and sections doesn't convey the complexity of volumes, the impact of the changing light throughout the day, throughout the seasons, the human interaction in space. One of the many aspects of the COVID pandemic, as we all worked remotely and apart, was that we missed experiencing the variety of enclosure and social opportunities that architecture gives us. There was a pause in cities, in experiencing life and the human encounters with other people. Lino Borbardi says, and I say, and I quote, until a person enters a building, climbs its steps, seizes the space in a human adventure that unfolds in time, architecture does not exist, end of quote. For us all now, it's clear that everything affects everything else. What we do as architects impacts on the materials of the earth, on climate, on health, on well-being for us all. What we specify as architects, we are, we are redistributing natural resources. And one of the most important natural resources is intelligence. The Swiss architect Annette Spiro said in a lecture called Seven Forms of Economy, and I quote Annette Spiro, you can economize on anything you like to in architecture, but don't do it in your thinking. Merci à vous. Thank you.